Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? Welcome to the bonus episode of Fundamental Health Podcast. I have so much exciting news to share with you guys. As you all know, if you got my newsletter, carnivoremd.com, to subscribe for that one, I have now launched a passion project. This thing I have been hinting at for so long is alive, and it is so exciting to share with you, heart and soil. This is my own line of desiccated organ supplements. You can check them out at heartandsoilsupplements.com. We are sourcing from grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised farms in New Zealand, and we are developing a U.S. supply chain in the near future. We are doing these unique formulations that are synergistic. Right now, we have bone marrow and liver and beef organs, and we are coming out with Blood Builder and a product called Fire Starter, which is a stearic acid-rich uh, suet in the very near future. Super exciting stuff. We've got all kinds of other products in the works. It is a passion of mine. It is a deeply rooted purpose to get as many people able to eat organ meats as possible and to support regenerative agriculture, which you will know if you've ever listened to this podcast. So check out heartandsoilsupplements.com. You can use the code CARNIVOREMD for 10% off your first order. I cannot wait to hear what you think of this. You can shoot me an email, drpaul, drpaul, at heartandsoilsupplements.com if you have any questions or you want to know about this or you want to know what I've been up to. But check us out, heartandsoilsupplements.com. I could not be more excited to share with this this with you guys. Um, these are really, really fun days for me, and I feel very blessed to be able to share this message of animal foods and nose to tail nutrition with as many people as possible and improve their lives in in good ways to make a difference. And my sister, my niece and nephew, who are the cutest kids in the world, I may be biased, take these supplements. My mom and dad take these supplements, and I'm so just, I feel so good to know that they have access to these nutrients, these unique and vital nutrients. And our bone marrow and liver is very unique. There's no other company on the market doing bone marrow without a flow agent like rice flour, which a lot of people don't want in their supplements. Ours combines these two in a synergistic fashion, allows for better absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins in liver and also all of the good stuff in bone marrow, essential fatty acids, signaling molecules, alkyl glycerols, and peptides like LL37. You can read about it all on the website. We put a lot of work into that. Heartandsoilsupplements.com, CarnivoreMD to check it out. I could not be more excited to share this with you guys. As you know, when this podcast comes out on Friday, July 31st, we are four days away from the release of the Carnivore Code Oh my goodness, you guys, this is also super exciting. Too many exciting things happening now. TheCarnivoreCodeBook.com to pre-order. On August the 4th, this baby drops. I cannot wait for all of you to get it in your hands, to read it, to listen to it. I recorded the audiobook in my own voice. It'll be out as soon as Amazon processes it. We've uploaded it to Audible weeks ago. So hoping that happens soon. And I am so excited for more and more people to understand that animal foods are so valuable in their lives. They have been incorrectly vilified and that including them with organ meats on your own uh, as fresh organ meats or with heart and soil with our desiccated supplements is going to just level up your nutrition and really help you all and the people you know, your mom, your grandma, your kids, everybody just crush it. And grandpa too. I always say grandma, but I don't want to leave out grandpa. All of them are going to be steak dancing and doing so much better. So there's just, there's so much cool, exciting stuff to talk about here. We're seeking truth. We are seeking to understand how to be healthy humans, how to mirror the way that our ancestors were eating and to really all just thrive and play and enjoy this short time uh, that we have on this earth to the fullest extent. So thank you for listening to this podcast. This is a fun one. This is my buddy, Anthony Gustin. He and I recorded this a few months ago when I was back in San Diego, but it is still a relevant conversation today. Anthony and I get to hang out more frequently now that he and I both live in Austin and we are very good friends. Anthony has a very interesting perspective on stuff. He has an amazing podcast called The Natural State, which you will hear me on next week with the book release week. And we talk about a lot of things in this, how to stay balanced, how our lives are different now than our ancestors used to be, the importance of regenerative agriculture, something that we believe in greatly at Heart and Soil Supplements, and many other things. So I think you guys will enjoy this kind of casual conversation with my buddy Anthony. 
It's not as technical as the podcast I usually do, but that's okay. You can see us let our hair down, even though both of us have very short hair. You can see us let our hair down and chill out and just have a conversation about life, how to move through it, how 2020 is really just not like humans are supposed to be living, and maybe how we can get around correcting that, stay centered, and live as healthfully and as happily um, for, like I said, for this time that we're on the earth. So check out Anthony Gustin's stuff. Check out his podcast, The Natural State, and enjoy this conversation we did together. Check out heartandsoilsupplements.com and the carnival or codebook.com. Thank you guys for listening. Listen after this podcast for what is going on with me. Anthony Gustin, my man, thanks for coming on. Hey, brother. It's good to have you. It's really good to have you, dude. It's, um, it's been too long since we've hung out. I mean, you crushed me in a workout when I was in Austin for Paleo FX. I don't think we've had a chance to, to do much since then. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been trying to keep the fridge stocked with lamb liver shots. Um, <laughs> How's it going? I, I, yeah, uh, it's going well. I got Martha to do it a couple more times since then, but yeah, I've actually been just freezing them like little chunks now, and then putting them like if I cook ground beef or whatever. Uh -huh. um, just way easier for me to like have yeah. one less thing to do because it's like for me, I have a lot of things going on right now. For me to have like another like it's almost like another supplement to take, and so I'm trying to simplify it. So I said like we had also we made chili two days ago. Uh -huh. And I put a bunch of heart and liver and stuff like ground, that ground up in it. Uh -huh. So I'm more so I'm like trying to just incorporate into other meals I'm having right now. But oh yeah, that's totally the way to do it. Are you people? People do. I I posted on my Instagram. I'm sure you saw it. Like people freaked out. <laughs> oh my god, you're gonna get liver fluke. You you freak. What are you doing this for? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're good on that that end yet. Oh man, I I don't. I mean, people will sometimes ask me, "What about parasites and liver?" And okay. it's like, look, everything I've read is that they're very rare freezing is going to kill some of them. And that if you're looking at the liver of well-raised animals, you can usually tell when there's like scars or there's any, you know, major flukes or anything or anything that would be infectious in there. So if people are really worried, they could certainly cook it, but you got to think like we eat a lot of food that's basically raw when you eat like a mid rare or a rare steak. So people, I don't know why people get freaked out. Yeah. I think that the best way to ameliorate that problem is by getting high quality food. Yeah, exactly. Get high quality food. Don't eat don't eat a, a rangy cow that you killed in somebody's backyard and right. yeah, in like a dumpster, you know, yeah, in like a, some, in like, or some pig that's like, you know, in, in Asia where, I mean, I know it's a big problem there with, with like raw pig stuff in countries like that. Right. Yeah. And of course, I mean, I think that they're, we're talking, if we're talking beef versus pork, what you're eating is beef liver, which is going to have different things. There are some parasites that happen in all animals, but they're pretty darn rare in like well-raised American, you know, grass fed or New Zealand grass fed animal parts, especially ruminants. Uh -huh. So pretty darn safe. Are you getting any other organs in? Um, I take like a, the ancestral supplements. I take some yeah. of their blends. Um, nice. Yeah. But like raw stuff, I just, I haven't found a good way to incorporate livers. Yeah. Livers and heart mostly. Liver and heart. Well, that's a good start. I've been, where, where, uh, am, I, where am I missing out on? Brain. <laughs> I, I get brain if like I'm in France and I see like on menus, I always get it. Brain yeah. is amazing awesome um i just I, I don't know where to get it around here um I'm going yeah hunting for the first time this weekend actually so you went hunting i'm going this weekend are you going what are you going to do bow or rifle uh i'm starting with rifle so the guy i'm going with is like you have to like you should learn how to actually hunt before you're worried about like, the technical thing of like how to kill the animal right like, learn like how to spot it like how to stock it like because uh -huh. I'm, I'm still right now i'm like man, I, I have to buy boots and camo and all that stuff. And like, I got a gun and like, I, I have to go to sighted in still. And like, there's all this stuff where it's like, just get good at actually going out and make sure you want to do this before you start practicing and getting proficient with, with, uh, with bow and arrow. So, and so I'm starting with the yeah, I love it. So tell me about hunting. Like what, what spurs you to go hunting? I mean, the people, people know you from the intro. You're the CEO of Perfect Keto. You've built this like huge, amazing company that's helped I would venture to say millions of people now incorporate the ketogenic lifestyle into their life. Like, like what's, what, what's got you interested in hunting, man? Yeah. I think it's just like, so the way I've sort of viewed health and this is something that is, you know, we could dig into this. Like, like I want uh, my next book. I want, want it to be about this essentially is like there's physical problems and there's um, mental problems. And then there's a, acute. It's like something I think about sort of like quadrant style of acute versus chronic and, physical or mental when it comes down to it, like problems you can have. So like acute mental is like you have PTSD from something acute right. physical is you get run over by a bus or something like that. The chronic side of things is how people are so messed up now. So 
we'll have stress, depression, et cetera. All of our top 10 causes of dying, except suicide, which actually is, a, I would argue, a chronic mental problem. Uh, but accidents, other than that, like every top 10 cause of death is a chronic problem. And all chronic problems in health are a mismatch between an organism and their environment. Yep. And so the natural state of an organism is health, right? And the, mo the, the more you get away from that natural environment, the, the more you will stack chronic problems and chronic you know, mental or physical health problems. And so, I mean, you know this with, you know, carnivore diet and things like that. Like, that's a very normal human thing. Um, but also, I think that there's, there's something to do with all of the things that you get when you stack hunting. So being that close to your food, being out there bonding with other people, being outside, like me just taking time away from work, like a forced two to three days. Like there, there's so many things for me that like, I'm the, the more you get away from your environment, the more messed up you'll be. And the closer you can get back to that environment, the, you know, the more it's just going to check boxes and getting you back to a healthy state of the human being. So there's that whole thing where I think it's just, there's probably a lot more to hunting and I've never done it before. This is my first time that I'm just not realizing is fulfilling and satisfying to like sort of complete the circle of life, know where my meat is coming from, like be in this closed loop system, this hunter gatherer type of mindset. Um, and I, I want to experience it. And I, and I want to know what it was like for humans in the past to have to have done this. I mean, to have never done that, but talk about what I, what I have been interested in over the last 10, 15 years, I think is not inauthentic, but it's just something that I really, it, it, you know, something that's interesting to me. Not only that, but we're going out on um, Rome Ranch, which is where, Oh, um, that's such a cool thing. Yeah. So they're doing a lot of like regenerative agriculture, stuff like that. And so they also have problems with some invasive species. So they have wild boar out there. They have a lot of axis deer who, that were, there are species that were released in Texas that now are taking over the area. And so it's also like to do a population control type of thing. And so there's all these different reasons. One, I want to eat it. Um, I want to get as, as highly nutritious and wild food as possible. I want to experience that and sort of close the loop. Um, I think that being part of this ecosystem restoration and regenerative agriculture and all this different stuff is fascinating to me. So there's a lot of reasons, but yeah, I'm pretty, pretty pumped. Yeah. You know, I, um, at the time this podcast between us gets released, I will have released a podcast which did, I did with our mutual buddy Monsol mm, about yeah. hunting. So I'm coming out to Austin in January and Monsol and I are taking a group hunting. You're welcome to come if you want. We're going hunting Sign in January. Yeah. We're going hunting in January, man. It's going to be, six or seven guys and girls and we're going to be out there, you know, looking at the stars and making fires and thinking about what it's like to be a part of that. So I'll be curious. I'll be super excited to hear what your hunting experience is like on the podcast with Monsal. I talked about this, but the, the one season that I bow hunted was one of the most um, moving experiences in my life. Just spending the time stalking the animals, being outside in the wilderness. It's such a primal thing. It really rekindled in me this, 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 fundamental desire to be out there doing that it was so it was so incredibly satisfying i think you're really going to dig it and then the yeah. meat is amazing yeah M monster does a way better job explaining sort of like the more spiritual side of hunting um so you did a good job that's yeah. you get it. i think i haven't experienced have experience yet so we'll i think you will yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and as on, on the podcast with monster what i talked about was that so often we're separated from that i think that you will probably look differently at all of the meat and animal foods that you eat after you're done hunting uh, because you'll be like, oh, I actually went and got that. I know what it looks like. And you've seen an animal die and you've felt, uh, you felt the sort of responsibility that comes with that. It changes you as a person. I think it's kind of sacramental. Yeah. I mean, I think that I've, I've experienced that to small degrees with even fasting for a long period of time. Yeah. Or, or you know, the first time that I did carnivore for extended period of time, I had a different relationship with food. And I think that this is just another one of those things where, you know, I've heard other people and their experiences. So I'm just interested in see what it'll be like for myself. That's awesome. And Rome Ranch, for people that may not be aware, is run by the people who used to own Epic, right? Epic, right? Like Epic Bars and Epic Foods. And they're doing some really cool things with regenerative agriculture, raising quite a few buffalo, I believe, and like a large yeah. herd of animals. Yeah. yeah. They, just launched, they just launched a new business called Force of Nature, which is they're taking all the animals on their land and they're processing and, and doing direct consumer. So they, they have like a ancestral blends of bison and beef where they ground uh -huh. up heart and liver into it uh -huh. venison wild boar elk um, bison all cuts like organs, uh -huh. everything it's awesome and so they're doing like an organ grind like a nose to tail yeah. organ grind of the meat yeah but, they, but all of the all of the meat that they sell is is fully regenerative and so, right yeah net negative carbon sink which is uh -huh. awesome yeah 
And if people aren't aware of that, I mean, I've talked a lot about with White Oak Pastures, but tell, tell us a little bit more about that because you were saying you're super excited about this. Tell me about, tell me about your, your take on regenerative agriculture. And I mean, dude, one of my biggest fears in life is that we're going to get to a state in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years where it's going to be like this dystopian future that <laughs> it's going to be impossible to get real food for a, a variety of different reasons. And I think that like we have a lot of economic incentives right now. Like people think that like morally and ethically that it's, it's best to not eat meat, right? This is, this is something that people look at, you know, beyond what was it, impossible burger, beyond meat, things like this. And I don't like, I sort of have shifted. Like I was pretty pissed at these companies before. I'm like, well, how can they get this girl this big? And I thought, okay, well, why are people buying them? You know, it's like, it's not all vegans, vegetarians or whatever. Even if it is like, they think they're doing the, the best thing for whatever reason. Like I don't judge people if they want to not have animal products, right? Right. right. It's, it's their decision, like totally fine. But when, when then they argue that it's more ethical, more sustainable or healthier, these things like I cannot agree with, like I want the truth. And if it turns out like I keep digging and I find out that being a vegetarian is all of those things, great. I will switch. Like I just want the truth. Right. However, it's not the case. And this is like, so sustainability is one of these things where we, we support these companies in mass because people think that they're like, we say, oh, global warming. It's all this, this huge problem. What should I do about it? Oh, it looks like I can make a choice today because like most people don't have a choice to what they do. Like they can ride their bike. They can, you know, don't use plastic straws, whatever. But in general, like people eat three times a day. So it's easy for these companies to leverage this like, hey, you're not contributing to this climate change, this global warming thing because animals do this. So you can, you know, you give this little Greta Thunberg or whatever, like saying like, best thing you can do is not eat meat. It's like, even when you look at like, even the estimates that show like, hey, th they contribute, which I don't agree with for a variety of reasons. It's like 3%, 3% of total carbon emissions, something like that. And that's of conventional farming. And that's still suspect. And I don't think looking at the whole like system of animal production, right. uh, all of the, yeah. Anyways. So then you, you take this back and like, I'm afraid of a future where this is going to snowball where people think it's the, the right thing to do ethically. And it's the right thing to do um, sustainably. And I mean, what's the, the health, healthiest thing as well. Like so much that things are going to be taxed and there's going to be laws around eating meat. But not only that, once we'd stop doing that, like it is terrible for the environment to not have large ruminant animals walk around in it. That is a key so, point. That is, so while we're doing that, so if we shift from eating meat to eating more vegetables, right? It's not going to happen on a small scale. It's going to happen on a large scale, meaning large agricultural scale. So people who go out there and say like, oh, I'm going to switch to from eating meat to eating vegetarian. They're not going to farmer's markets to get all this stuff. They're, they're going to Trader Joe's or Safeway or HEB or Whole Foods or whatever and buying produce in bulk. This produce is grown on land where generally speaking, it destroys the soil after three, four, five, six, seven years. And so that soil then not only is devoid of nutrients now because they're growing the same crops over and over and over again, but it's, it's not, again, it's not a normal environment for our ecosystem to have just one thing grown in it over and over and over again. So we need different animals on different parts of the land at different times, different crops, different, different times. And then when that happens, what happens is the soil, literally the depth of the soil shrinks down, becomes less nutrient dense. You can't grow anything in it. And it becomes a, a dust bowl, which actually exacerbates climate change and global warming. And so the more we shift from animal production to plant production, the more we're going to have a long tail effect on climate change, not a short term effect. And so what people like um, Rome Ranch are doing is they're, they got all these, like they basically took this worthless piece of land like hour and a half northwest of Austin and put a bunch of bison on it and like are, are doing what's, what's called regenerative agriculture. So each system, each, so like they put bison on it, which then pound their manure into the soil. The soil gets more healthy, more diverse. Then they could start growing plants on it and could start doing all this other stuff, getting chickens on it and like rotating these animals and crops all over the place. Having more soil sinks carbon into the soil that turns into whatever, I mean, if the grass, then the grass goes into the bison and then we eat the bison and sort of this like circle of life type of thing that actually restores climate, not exacerbates it. So this is one of those things where like we think that we're doing a good job, but really if you actually look at the whole system, which is complex, people don't want to understand it. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's frightening. And so 
I am scared of that future. And so I, I want to learn more about it and figure out, I mean, I'm sort of just an entrepreneur at heart. And so like, I love figuring out problems. For example, you know, I have the company Perfect Keto. I, I, don't, I don't think that Perfect Keto or keto in general is the answer for everybody. Sounds a little counterintuitive coming for me, right? I think that it is an amazing tool to help meet people where they're at to get them to a point where they're where going to have success. Right. And so, for instance, like I, I totally support all the stuff you guys are doing. I think that a lot of the carnivore diet is great. However, I think that like when it comes down to it, people going from a standard American diet to carnivore, like there's just a lot of people we're going to miss by not giving them an alternative of like, hey, here's what's going on. And so, for instance, uh, we are so metabolically damaged as a country that, you know, I, I grew up eating tons of carb, like three, 400 grams of carbohydrates in the most processed food. Uh, my metabolism was jacked for a really long period of time. Um, and sort of like how I think about these big, like chronic problems like this. So for instance, like I was really overweight when I was younger, had a lot of, a lot of metabolic dysfunction. Um, if I would go out and walk off the curb of my front steps and sprain my ankle, my ankle would heal just fine. Right. Uh, if I go out and a bus runs over my leg, I might have a problem <laughs> with that leg for a while or like it can't even be fixed again. Right. And so the larger the um, environmental change and how far a human is away from their environment, sometimes the more extreme it, it should be. And that's why I think like carnivore has been great for a lot of people, but we're just trying to create ultimately a bridge for people to get from being unhealthy people eating standard American diet to having them have accessible products so that we can make an inch their way towards whatever success is for them. And if, if for people, if they're at standard American diet and they can make the jump to carnivore and eat real food, amazing. Like I want, like I want people to be there at that end of the spectrum. One of the spectrum is totally processed food. The other end of the spectrum is, is whole real foods of whatever kind. And like, I, I, I'm scared of the, the carnivore diet getting a little dogmatic. Cause I think that once a diet hits point of, of dogma, then, then somebody, everybody looks for something else. And I think that keto has sort of tipped that balance. I think carnivore is going to get there soon, but ultimately like you can't argue that people should be eating real food. Like no, that, that is the can't. ultimate end. And that's yeah. where we want to get people. And that's what I want people to know, which is like move from eating all this garbage in here and then go over there. So sort of a long way to say like, I want to learn about regenerative agriculture as well, because the way I think about these problems and, and I was able to do it and then scale perfect keto the way it is, like I love thinking of a business as a way to like force change upon the system. And so for us, like I, I used to be a healthcare practitioner. I was a clinician in San Francisco, I had a bunch of clinics. I was, I was just looking at myself, it's like, wow, people are really, really sick. Like why is this the case? Ultimately from eating processed food, not moving, et cetera, like all these different things, but I saw nutrition being the biggest lover. So then I use this business in the window of keto. You're like, okay, let's, let's use this as a wedge to help people become healthier. And so now I'm looking at different problems as, you know, I just learn more and more. I'm learning about regenerative agriculture. It fires me up because like, I, I think that with what they're doing with force of nature is going to be one business that creates massive change in this stuff in this ecosystem. And like, I, like I'm, I'm sort of like thinking as I create a business and products, like how do I trick people effectively into making better choices? And so that might sound a little diabolical, but ultimately like I, I'm trying to put some value in the world by like convincing people to make better choices that help, them be healthier people. Does yeah, totally. So that's why I want to dig into it more and like learn about it. I mean, I, I think that like as we go over the next 10, 15 years, like if I can create a business that helps regenerative ag and people eating more animal products, so that way I can avoid my dystopian future of literally not being able to buy real meats. Like when we get to a point, and I, I, sorry for me freaking out on this little tangent here, but like when we get to a point, Paul, where we like, where we can grow meat in a lab, there, there's going to be a very hard division of like people fighting for real food because if it, if it is cheaper, if it tastes like meat and it's grown in a lab and we can not kill anything, we will have an ethical responsibility to be like, okay, do we continue killing things or do you eat this other thing? I, I think it is a terrible idea to do that because I understand or think I understand the importance of complex systems. Like the human body is a complex system. We don't know anything about it yet. As far as I know, like we know, like we know some pathways, we can see some pathways. We have no idea what pathways in the human body interact with what pathways. And so the human body is one crazy complex system that we do not understand. We don't, we don't understand the brain. We don't understand the gut. We don't understand anything. We, we like have barely scratched the surface in my opinion. 
an, an animal is another complex system. Okay. The nutrients in an animal, like, wh- like how it gets a certain way, et cetera. And then now we're talking about combining two complex systems. We don't know us eating animals and then us getting nutrients from that. So like the animal is a complex system. We're a complex system. If we don't understand either of those things, we think that we're going to know like, Oh yeah, just make this lab grown meat and it will have these nutrients. Like, no, we like we, until we know how like every single thing in the human body works and every single thing in a cow or whatever animal you're eating works and all the nutrients and all the effects. Like, I don't think we're even going to know that. And if we are, we're not going to be humans anymore and we're not going to need nutrition. And so like, I think that it's, it's going to be tough because like, we're going to have elected government officials who think, okay, we can use this technology to feed the world and to do all these things that is going to make animal production very, like it's going to look very irresponsible on the outside. And it frightens me. Anyway, that's my, that keeps me up at night. I love it, dude. We've covered so many things there that we should unpack a little bit. I love it. I freaking love it. I just let you go. I was like, oh, Anthony is fountain gold right now. <laughs> so I, I think that what you said in the beginning rings true through all of this. When we take an organism and we take the organism out of their natural environment, the organism gets sick. I've said before that chronic disease is a genetic environmental mismatch. And it's, that's essentially the same thing yeah. that you're saying. Our human organism, when our environment is messed up, and we take ourselves out of the natural environment that we've been in, whether it's sun, exercise, community, meaningful activities, hunting animals, eating animals, eating natural foods, because I do think that we ate plants from time to time. And we can talk about that as well. Um, When we take humans out of that, we get sick. And so for me, I love that you brought up regenerative agriculture because I see regenerative agriculture as one of these ways that we can start to return to that. Because that's essentially what regenerative agriculture is. It's returning the way that we raise animals to their natural environment. You know, the way that ruminant animals have been grazed in the past is that they will put them on a small plot of land and let them eat the grass all the way down to the roots. The grass dies and then the soil is destroyed and you get there in grasslands. What Alan Savory first talked about and other people in the regenerative agriculture space and what they're doing now at farms like uh, Rome Ranch and White Oak Pastures in Georgia, which I'm sure you're aware of, um, is they're, they're doing rotational grazing where they don't, they put the animals on a bigger plot of land. They don't let them eat the grass all the way down so the grass can regenerate. And then they're pooping on the, on the ground, which includes phosphorus and organic matter. As you said, it creates a larger root structure, a more organified uh, topsoil layer, which can sequester more of the carbon dioxide in the environment, in the atmosphere. And like you were you were describing. And so they, it, the way that the bison used to move and the way that animals move is that they won't eat the grass all the way down to the ground. They'll, they'll eat it and then they'll move on. They won't kill the grass, right? So animals in the, our environment understand that we're part of a system and they don't go around destroying fields. You know, an animal won't just like, generally speaking, a ruminant animal won't just eat the grass until it's all dead. They'll move around like the bison did. And so that's what places like Rome Ranch and White Oak Pastures are trying to do. And by doing that, they're improving the quality of the soil. And for me, this is a mirroring of the way that we belong in the environment. That's how they belong in the environment. That's how the environment gets to be better. And I love that you alluded to the ecosystems concept because once we trace this trajectory, this scary trajectory, the Greta Thunberg trajectory that we're going on now, which is terrifying to the nth degree, it is lab grown meat, which is horrible in so many ways because as you suggested, this is an ecosystem. If we take ruminant animals off the land, our ecosystem will collapse. And, and, you know, and you and I will hopefully be in the same tribe somewhere in British Columbia hunting for the last remaining animals left on the earth. And it'll be a little bit like the walking dead because you know, everybody will just yep. be eating shitty lab grown meat that is actually, and if you look at lab grown meat, it's crazy because that is quite a serious carbon producer. So we can get into this a little bit in this discussion, but if yes. you look at the carbon yeah. footprint, I, yeah. I also like want, want to pause for a second. Like when people say lab grown meat, currently it is not lab grown meat. Like it is like we say that, but it's not, it's, it's fake meat. Right. Right. That, this is beyond yeah. burger. And, yeah. Yeah. But pe- people, people hear that and they think like, Oh, it's being grown. Like, no, no, no. They're just, it's processed food. It's it bamboo is. and sawdust. It's, it's yeah. In, yeah. In, in vegetable oil and soy protein, et cetera. Yes. Um, Lab, lab grown meat, which will come soon, in my opinion, like five, 10 years. Yeah. Is like actually taking a culture of animal cells. Yes. And growing new animal cells from those animal cells. 
you, you, I think this is a very important distinction for a lot of people. They don't understand that. Like that's going to change a lot of things. Yes. Like, this is just the first, the fake meat processed meat is just the first step. You cannot like just f- from a sheer physics standpoint, think about like, it's going to require, we, we are like cows right now and like animals in general and our food is solar powered. So if we go to lab ground meat, we're going to have to get the energy somewhere. Like right now, the sun's energy goes, hits plants, the plants store that energy, then the ruminants eat that energy and condense it and turn it into nutrients we can eat. And then we eat that energy. Like we're, we're go- we're, you have to have an energetic input somewhere. And so if we're going to switch to lab ground meat, not only is it not going to have the nutrients because it, it can't. You, you can't combine nothing into something, but it's going to be all this energetic input that we're not accounting for right now. And I think that, yes, it totally makes sense. And the other thing that let's highlight for people. So I did a podcast with Peter Ballerstead that I will recommend people listen to if they're interested in these environmental concepts. What you suggested was completely right. If you look at the EPA reports, the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Sea reports from 2014 and 2017, ruminant agriculture is 1.9% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions, and we can qualify this in a moment, in the United States, 1.9%. Animal agriculture, other than ruminants, is another 2%. Plant agriculture is 4.5%. So plant agriculture is more than all animal agriculture combined. And so, but even between plant and animal agriculture, you're only at about nine or 10%. That means 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions in this country come from things like transportation, technology, electricity generation, and um, burning of fossil fuels. This is what people are being misled. When Greta Thunberg says eating meat is the best thing, not eating meat is the best thing you can do, or Bill Gates says we need to stop eating meat, this is completely myopic baloney. You know, this is, this is, this is not even close to being the biggest thing we can do. The biggest thing we could do is figure out how do you have less reliance on fossil fuels, which are used to power automobiles, to generate the electricity in our homes. You know, people forget that in order to generate electricity, you have to burn coal. And so somewhere, when you flip the light on in your house, there is coal being burned, unless it's from a solar or hydroelectric plant. But even what you're putting in your Tesla, you know, um, you know can be coming from coal-based emissions. You have to burn coal to make electricity. And so I think that this is the problem that we face, but getting ruminants off the planet is not the answer in yeah. any way, shape, or form. You know, all those things you just said were, are, these are non-real environment things. It's like if, you, if you're driving a car, if you're flying a plane, if you're turning on a light switch, this is an abnormal environment for the ecosystem of right. the planet. Well, again, you're looking at chronic problems, chronic, like this applies to everything, this applies to the planet. It's an abnormal thing to have this much carbon going in the atmosphere. So it is. So we're going to have a long-term problem. And like, I, I don't know. I don't know the path. I, I, it, it has to be technology to fix it because there's no way we can reverse what we're doing. Like we can't just go live hunter-gatherer lives anymore. It's just right. the way it is. It's like we can't go back that way. It's like the, the train is certainly rolling. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm interested to see what's going to happen. But Yeah, who knows? But there's, I'm struck by the hypocrisy of athletes or whoever standing in front of their private jet saying eat less animals for the environment Mm -hmm. the amount of carbon that you're putting in the environment by flying in that jet is astronomically larger than the amount of carbon that's going into ruminants and then let's just talk about for the carbon cycle for a moment the fact that the carbon that is created by a ruminant animal from their burps mostly not their farts the methane is not new carbon it's part of a cycle that happens where where a ruminant animal produces some methane. I mean, humans produce methane and it goes into the environment. It goes into the atmosphere and over a 10 year period, it gets fixed into carbon dioxide. Well, then that carbon dioxide gets used by plants in the process of photosynthesis to become carbohydrates that we eat. It's a cycle of carbon. There is no new carbon created. Even that 1.9% of carbon that, that ruminants are putting into the greenhouse gas is not new carbon. But when we take carbon that is fixed into the environment, right? Um, In the form of like deposits or coal. And we release that into the environment. That is new carbon. That is like spontaneous new carbon. I would say, I would say it's not new carbon because it was, it was there before it was just stored in a way we couldn't access and burn. Exactly. It's this artificial 
introduction introduction of, of carbon. Right, right. There's right. no, it's not, but so it's, it, but it's contributing to the overall totally. amount of carbon, totally. whereas yeah. the carbon cycle with ruminants, same amount of carbon yeah. just so, cycling so around. To, to get a ruminant to the point where it can produce methane, it needs to consume like all like plant matter and to get a plant matter to grow, then that needs to take in carbon dioxide. Right. You, you can't get to a methane producing creature without that cycle feeding itself. Exactly. But like if all this, all this plant matter billions of years ago all melted down and then stuck in the, the earth's crust somewhere and then we dug it up and burned it like, yeah, that's the problem. Like that, again, an artificial input to the environment. Yeah. An animal eating grass is not artificial. Us digging up stuff and burning it is artificial. Like that, yeah. There's two, like that's what we need to look at here. Yeah. And there's, so there's two different inputs there. And I think people need to realize like this is not the problem. And regenerative agriculture is a good step in the right direction because I believe, I think you would as well, that putting more ruminants on the planet is the answer both for human health and for environmental processes and for regeneration of the land because you also touched on the soil. Man, it's, a, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a freaking war, I bet. <laughs> but uh, sign me up. <laughs> I guess that's what we do, man. Yeah. It, to me, now it seems like a battle for the hearts and minds of people and an educational battle because for everything that we are trying to say, there are, there are people saying the opposite. And I think the consumer is kind of throwing their hands up going, what is the truth? It's, it's like, this is, I guess this is like a philosophical fact of life. Like it, it, both sides cannot be correct here. You know, <laughs> there, there is some truth within this and it's, right it's kind of up to us to be able to enumerate it, to be able to explain it to people in the most clear way possible to provide the most substantial evidence so that the consumer can say, ah, look, this rhetoric on the plant-based side is actually not accurate and we should not be listening to this. Ruminant animals are what we've been eating forever. They're a good source of nutrition. They do not contribute greenhouse gases in a way that's dangerous to the environment and we should be looking in other places if we really want to reverse global climate change. Yeah. I had a thought about, this is totally different um, off topic, but All right. M Martha and I were in San Francisco and then flew up to uh, Seattle and then we're down in Palm Springs like all of the last couple of weeks. And traveling, I love traveling because it like helps me think of the world a different way and like see different things and like tie together different concepts. I went to a Whole Foods in San Francisco, in Seattle and in Palm Springs. And every every place I went to is like extremely different. So San Francisco was like great 60s, 70s. Seattle was like 40s, 50s and raining. Palm Springs was like desert, hot, blazing. They all had the same exact food. <laughs> and if, if I were to go out without a grocery store, I would not have access to the same food. You see, I'm going here. Like, I think that like, I, so when I think of this stuff, like, and this is why I wanted to do carnivore diet in the first place. It's like, it fascinates me like why things are working. And I think that like, ultimately, yes, I agree with all the points that people make in a carnivore community of, you know, plants are toxins and like, they, like half, like they have to, because like, this is how their defense mechanisms are set up. Like, I, I, right. I get that. But I'm trying to think like, okay, there's a problem with the way people are eating right now. It's like clearly problematic when people are eating a lot of this food. But like you said, like humans did eat plants for history. Like right. some cultures ate more, some cultures ate less. You can't, but you can't tell me that like, it's, it's so bad that people, like every person is going to die. It's more so like what I think of it is always like when it comes down to like seasonality and like, again, mimicking the environment, there should have been no environment where we would have access to this. Like you always have access to animals because animals are always on living. You should not have the same access to plants year round. You should not have, same, you should not have this. Like, and also when I saw those plants all available in each place, it was the same like 15 to 20 things. Oh, it's probably the same four things that have been yeah. crossbred, so, right? So, but the same 15 or 20 things, but, but people in their shopping carts, and I, I've done this in the past as well, it's like you, you have your go-tos, you know what you're going to make. Like, it's, it's, uh, you don't mix it up. And so you go out there and like, you buy cabbage and kale and spinach and you eat that every day for years on end. Like that, like, so spreading out the toxin load is something that we just don't do anymore. No. I'm sure you've probably you have talked about this before, like I have come to this realization, but I just thought about it like, like, Oh, okay. The plants necessarily aren't going to kill you. It's just like, if you had, I mean, what was like, I'm sure you know some of these numbers you're amazing with your memory, but like how many plants did hunter gatherer societies typically eat? I mean, like, it depends. Like hundreds. It depends, depends on the, like, it depends on the society. Yeah. Yeah. But, but like hundreds, 
and think about it, you'd walk around, you'd find something, you'd eat it, like you, you'd be desperate. Like, it, I don't know. There's probably a lot here, but if you have hundreds of different plants, like, let's not even talk about GMOs here because like this is another, another <laughs> like now, now, they're, now they're producing artificial toxins that you're eating. Um, but if you're spreading out the, that diversity, not only like buy plant on a micro scale, but seasonally in a macro scale, like nobody, nobody does this anymore. So I'd be interested to see if you align some people, like you said, it's genetic and environment thing. Like take some of the people, uh, if you want to do this little research experiment, or if anybody listening wants to do this, like if, if you're carnivore, like nothing else worked for you and going on carnivore diet was amazing. I wonder if those people going to like what worked f- like for their population genetic wise, like I'm from like France, Germany border ish, like, like for generations. Um, was confirmed by like my mom's family tree going back like almost a thousand years as well as um, my uh, 23andMe test. And so like, I would say, okay, what does that area look like from seasonality and how can I eat like a hundred different plants or vegetables? Like you, you can't even do that anymore. Like, it's almost impossible. It's so, totally, yeah. So the question is like, like, I, th- like, is that why the carnivore diet is working so well. It's like, we can't even replicate our natural environment anymore. Is that why? Um, could be, could be the case, but like even, you know, 20, 30, 40 different things. Like I think it's possible. You'd have to have your own garden. You have to do that. But like, I wonder if like that would work for those people. It's possible. And I love that you brought up earlier in this conversation, the sort of the kiss of death with dogma, dogmatism. And I hope that in the work I'm doing, I'm not becoming too dogmatic about a carnivore diet. I have a whole section in my book about how to be carnivore ish and which plants are less toxic and how to think about that. And I think the point you're illustrating now is well taken that I, I try not to say to people carnivore is the only way. There are millions and millions of people on the earth who are kicking major ass eating, eating plants. My main message has been, hey, if you're not kicking all the ass you want to kick or you're really sick, eliminating plants is a really viable option and it works for a lot of people. I do think like you suggested, our ancestors ate plants throughout our evolution. My premise is that it really only happened most of the time when they were during times of starvation as major food staples. But you're right. There was, if they were starving, it was what was available at the time. And there was quite a lot of variety and a huge amount of plants going to grocery stores as you're observing is the same amount of plants are the same different types of plants in every grocery store all over the world, because we don't have wild plants. We don't have seasonality to plants. We don't have seasonality to macronutrient ratios. We don't have seasonality to fruit consumption or anything. And this is probably a real problem for people. And even though they try and eat healthy or they might do paleo or AIP, they're still eating cauliflower five times a week, or they're eating a brassica vegetable five times a week, which is something our ancestors would probably never, ever, ever have done because that vegetable, I mean, brassicas are actually a pretty hardy species, but um, you know, that, that wouldn't have been around or they would have been something else or they would have been hunting. This is actually mirrored by animals. Even herbivorous animals get this, and humans have forgotten it. There's a, there's a great podcast I listened to on Ben Greenfield a while ago, and I forget the name of the person that he had on, but this was a um, sort of a, a ruminant agriculture animal specialist. And he was saying that if you look at the way that ruminants graze, and all herbivores tend to do this, they will eat small amounts of various plants moving on from plant to plant limiting their toxin load, not exceeding a certain toxin load threshold. And if there are historical examples of crowding of animals, overpopulation due to farming or um, land encroachment by human civilization, in which animals, there have been large uh, die-offs of wild animals because they've been crowded into an area and had to overeat one type of plant, which had a particular toxin and they got, they exceeded their toxin threshold. But if you look at the way that animals eat, in a field, if they're given enough different types of plants, they'll eat a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. They realize that's pretty toxic and only eat a small amount and they'll move around and they'll eat various parts of different plants. And I think that that level of complexity is something that we've lost as humans. Yeah. Our hunter-gatherers ancestors probably knew that. They said, ah, we can eat a little bit of this plant, but we can't eat it all the time if we need this to survive. And so now we're kind of faced with, that's I think where the carnivore diet comes in. It's like this it's so much easier just to say like, Hey, we're just going to, you can get all the animals you want as if your ancestors were quite successful. Let's just eliminate the plants for some amount of time or for a long time, get you better and then reintroduce if you want or not. Um, but trying to mirror that type of a cycle now is very hard without, with all that lost knowledge. Well, it's sort of going back to the point that we both made about how far away you are from your, your natural environment is how sick you are. Right. 
And yeah. so tr- for, mo- for majority of people right now, let's just put real food into two buckets, animal products, plant products, right? Yeah, sure. It is really easy to go back to your natural environment right now. But if like looking at the bucket of animal products, like, yeah, you can get like, not hunting meat or whatever, like even farm, you're like, okay, it's close enough. It's almost impossible due to what I said about the grocery store, unless you're growing your own food at home or like, even if you're doing that, it's, it's like almost impossible to go back to our natural environment by eating plants. Like, what we you see and how we see it. And I mean, you make an interesting point that you're sort of Northern European. I think the question is how many generations does it take for your genetics to adapt? Because we know that 50,000 years ago, that was homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Right. And, and they were mostly carnivorous according to stable isotope studies. So, so he, here's another thought that I had that I was like, should I ever talk about this? Because in this me too culture, like I'm going to be labeled a racist, um, but I'll throw it out here just because <laughs> you, you probably have a really rational audience. Um, I was like, huh, you can take somebody, you know, from different cultures and, you know, you look at their skin and the way their body is shaped and everything else like this. And so like skin color is due to your environment, like your, your body, the way you're shaped, the way you look is due to your environment, right? So I have darker, or lighter skin that's due to my exposure to sunlight over a long period of time, right? So you take that person and you put them for like, like skin color doesn't really change if you're in a different environment. But like, how long does it, t- how long will it take for, to take somebody who is African American, has black skin tone, and you put them in, you, they're not living in Sweden, for them, for like, if, if they like don't have split of, of genetics, like if you take that family, and you take a couple families, and they're breeding in Sweden, how long would, would it take for their skin to adapt to that environment, so that way they look like somebody who looks like they're from Sweden? How long would it take? <sighs> thousands so of generations we we accept that on a physical like outward scale why the hell are we not putting that internally like thinking like oh, oh yeah the, the foods you eat also like that like you need to adapt to that like thousands of generations yeah with to, with, ad- to adapt to your environment that way yeah with so, consistent selective pressures we can we can see people and like oh you you haven't adapted to this like you're you you've been here for nine generations and your skin tone hasn't adapted to this environment yet. So why do we expect our insides to be adapting? No, I think that's a, yeah, that's a main. And I think there's also no selective pressure for that anymore either. And it was very different when we were hunter gatherers. Like, you know, the way that, the way that this appears to work from my estimation is that there has to be a selective pressure that affects reproductive uh, efficacy. And so if, if people had light skin and they were in Africa and people had dark skin and they were in Africa, the people that were in dark skin had more protection from the sun and they were much more likely to breed. Well, the way it is now we've removed all those natural pressures, natural selective pressures, because we live inside air conditioned, heated, you know, the natural world can't affect our ability to reproduce anymore. That, that, that's not, it's like all of those have gotten thrown off. I actually sort of disagree. So I think like, the environment is doing that to some degree, right? So for example, if you are, if you're a woman and you are extremely overweight or like, so take two people, feed them the same diet. Like, you know, some people who just eat shit and they look still like, like you, like super lean and ripped and like high energy. It's like, I have friends like that who like can eat anything they want. Right. I'm not that way. I would break. I, I <laughs> have been broken before and I will break. So those people to a large degree have a harder time having kids doesn't mean they're not going to but then we like so looking at our environment and what we're in right now like there still is a little bit of that i would say like female yeah a little bit it's harder for males i would say like this this doesn't apply for males it applies a little bit more for females but i think there's still like a little bit of that of like can you respond to this insult and still survive like it's it's much more like a of a i know we're sort of having a reverse population curve and like this conversation can go really crazy places right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a little like not necessarily like as big of the environment uh, as it was before for sure. Like we, we yeah. removed a lot of it, but there's still some of it. There is some. And I think we see that the rising rates of female infertility as a exactly. canar- canary in the coal mine there. And that's what's so interesting to me when women anecdotally, admittedly, but when women anecdotally improve fertility by cutting out gluten or cutting down carbohydrates or becoming more insulin sensitive or by going carnivore, by going keto or any of these things, you're like, aha, see, that's, that was it. But what happens so often now is people just go to IVF 
and it has to do with who can afford in vitro fertilization. And so, but we've developed so many of these ways to circumvent these things. I mean, infertility is, is a fascinating thing. It's like, what's, what's going on there? You know, where is the genetic environmental mismatch here that's creating infertility for people? And we've circumvented it. So people aren't going to change their, they're not going to change their food if they can just have a baby with IVF most of the time. Sometimes they're fairly astute and they'll, they'll do those things and they can, they can avoid that. But yeah, there's something going on there. But for the most part, as you're suggesting, there are a lot of people who can get to reproductive fertility 19, 20 years of age and eat McDonald's hamburgers their whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, of which the worst part would certainly be the bun, you know, but, <laughs> and, and maybe the, uh, maybe the tomatoes, but who knows, that's debatable. So, you know, it's, I think that there's, there's no selective pressure there to be people who are more adapted to our environment now, our junk food environment, because anyone can get to 20 years old and pass their genes on. But when we were living, you know, when in your ancestors and my ancestors were running around Europe in loincloths and spearing a, you know, spearing elephants and stuff and throwing rocks at lions, it was, it was a different story. There was a real pressure on who has more muscles, who has more ability to recover, who has more ingenuity, who has more ability to be protected from the sun or from the cold, you know, who is going to generate more body heat. So those things are kind of selected for in a different way. That's just kind of my okay. thinking about it. Do you think we'll need to go back to a point where it becomes complete anarchy? to see to see it's like we said before like we can't get back unless unless we like completely tear down the system like so is this your you think we need to go back there or what i don't know man i hope not i would you know yeah, when, I would, when, I, when i was in medical school i watched a little bit of the walking dead and i think i've always had i've always been drawn to like these zombie apocalypse shows and yeah so. i think a, i think a post-apocalyptic what was that movie with will smith that post-apocalyptic movie do you know what i'm talking I about imagine. I am legend. Yeah. Where he's like running around from those zombies. Yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of stuff always appeals to me. Cause I'm like, yeah. Oh, that, I, I don't know. To me, that's like, we've created this overly concretized society and we're living in buildings and there's that Pacific crest trail part of me from 20 years ago that just wants to live in the woods. And there's, you know, that's counteracted by the part of me that wants to have community and, and contribute yeah. in, a, in a positive way and, and do things and build things within a Western society. But there's, there's a little bit of a fantasy spinning in my mind about a, about a zombie apocalypse or some kind of like huge apocalypse where it's like, Oh, like this is cool. We get to go back to tribal life. Like let's go hunt some stuff and things might be less stressful, but that, that could be a little bit of escapism on my part. So I don't know. It would totally be more stressful for sure. Like, <laughs> you think it'd be more stressful? <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be more stressful. However, I think that it could be in a different way. Like I actually did this thought experiment not too long ago and it's good for people to like to assess like, Where's your life at as a, as a human? And it was like, man, if we got to that state, like what would happen if like in Austin right now, like things went fucking nuts and like we lost power and people couldn't get food from grocery stores and like all the public utilities went out and we had to like all go disband and be in the woods around here and like live that life, zombie or not. I, I, I thought like, what would be a good day? What would be a good day? It's It'd be true. like, I would play, I would ha- probably hang out with some people connect with some humans, I would not have any major conflict and I would eat a good meal. That's it. Like that, that'd be, a, that'd be an awesome day. That'd be a good day. You know what I mean? It's like beyond that, like what would you, you know, what would you do? <laughs> It'd be a lot of figuring out how to survive. Which is sort of uniquely satisfying. I'll tell you. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I think sure. this may, um, I'll be curious to hear what you think of the hunting experience. And maybe I can ask you about how much, you know, like, backpacking and stuff you've done. I haven't done a lot in years, but I had the whole time when I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. So I spent three and a half months, um, you know, I spent three and a half months on the Pacific Crest Trail uh, in my early 20s. And man, it was so satisfying to just get up every day and have three tasks, you know, eat, stay dry, stay warm and move, you know, just get to the next place. It was so satisfying at a fundamental level to have those survival type tasks. And we had food that we brought on our backs, but it was really, really cool. And in some way it was very joyous to have that right. simplicity of life around survival. Like, and, and it would be harder if we were, you know, didn't have food on our backs. And I was sort of, that's kind of like in between, right? Because we could ship food to ourselves in, in post offices and all these things. But I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, satisfaction that I have drawn in the past from just surviving. 
from just being in the wilderness when I'm backpacking again, it's been a long time for me, but on the Pacific Crest Trail, there was just a lot of joy in just walking and, and searching food and eating food and, and surviving that, that we kind of miss now. You know, there's right. like, we, it's easy yard for us because we've gotten all of our food butchered and delivered to grocery stores, but that act of acquiring the food is, is really kind of meaningful. And the act of being in the wilderness and just kind of surviving is, I don't know. I find that uniquely valuable as a human. And I don't know that I want to go back to it right now, but um, there's something joyous about a simple survival life that I've experienced. And again, that is privileged because I was not in like a bare grills type survival situation, but maybe you and I should do that in the future. Yeah. I think that, I think that you and I should just like do, you know, like loincloths and just go <laughs> hang out somewhere in the woods and see how we do. It's really a hell of a time. What did you, what did you eat when you went on that? Like, what did you ship yourself? Uh, so this was in my early twenties and this is a funny story here. So I was not very nutritionally savvy. I was done with college and had only been out for a little while and didn't know what to eat. And I, at the time, this was again, 20 years ago, was influenced by vegetarian ideals and thought, I'm going to do the best food I can for this trail. And the best food I can for the, I did for the trail was mostly plant foods. Um, and so I dehydrated a ton of stuff. So we did like, I hiked it with my buddy Broxton and I did like dates and I dehydrated tons of fruits and vegetables and made sauces. And I had a, a 12, lever de 12 level dehydrator that took me weeks and weeks and weeks to dehydrate all the food for the PCT. And so then we partitioned it off into 27 boxes that are resupply boxes that you ship to yourself along this 2,700 mile trail from Mexico to Canada. And I'll tell you what, my buddy was like, I'm going to bring jerky. And I was like, I don't need jerky. I'll be good. Within the first day, I was like, give me some <laughs> of that jerky. And the jerky was the most precious thing we had on the whole trail. And I started buying jerky as much as I could and incorporating more meat as the trail went on. And then every time we got to a town, the first thing we both did was eat as much meat as we could because it was so, so good for us. But it was sort of like the beginning of my, you know, nutritional Thanks. journey. Yeah. Thinking, oh, plants are going to be great. But you know, what's interesting. And I wrote this in the, my book is that I got sick of all the non-processed plant foods that I brought you would think, I think a lot of people imagine that if they could eat peanut butter for the rest of their life, they would never get sick of it. You will get sick of peanut butter. It happens very, very quickly when you eat it every day. The only things I didn't get sick of in the plant food world were the processed foods like Pop-Tarts. I never yeah. got sick of Pop-Tarts and I did eat Pop-Tarts on the Pacific Crest Trail. I never got sick of Pop-Tarts, but I never got sick of the animal foods. I could eat cheese at the time. I don't want to do it now. I could eat cheese or cream cheese or meat every single day on the PCT. But by the end of the trail, I threw out all of my trail mix. I threw out all of like the muesli I'd packed. I threw out all the peanut butter. I didn't want any of that because it was just so, uh, my body was so yeah. sick of it. Yeah. Do you think you could easily do it carnivorous, the, the trail? Oh, absolutely. I know you could do it carnivorous. Yeah. What, what would your fat sources be? Like go to? It's like you, you, so do you, you don't even mess around with like coconut oil or anything, do you? No, I don't because, and uh, it's just a variety of reasons. Like there's oleosins and coconut oil and all the vegetable oils. There are these proteinaceous particles yeah. in, in, in the fat droplets. And I just find the animal fats to be richer and more nutrient. They have a few more of the fat soluble nutrients in them. But my fat source would probably be just trimmings. I mean, it would depend on how I were going to do it. If I were going to do the Pacific Crest Trail over, I would do, I would probably just have trimmings from animals, like actual tallow, not rendered tallow, but just either suet or tallow. And that can stay like shelf stable. Like how would you keep that? Uh, it can stay shelf stable for probably, yeah. I mean, once you, once you render it, it's totally shelf stable. And I think it would stay shelf stable for a good week or so, even out of refrigeration. Yeah. So Maybe, how would you, yeah. how would you ship that to yourself? And then, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think you'd probably have to do some, some finagle. I'd have to think about how to do it. You might have to render it. I might have to do a lot of rendered fat. Like, kind of like pemmican that Native Americans yeah. did where they would boil the fat down and then put the jerky into the fat. But I mean, you could make a pemmican out of like liver and kidney and organ meats and muscle meat and fat. And that would be fantastic. As long as you had enough salt, you'd be good. at just cruise. Hmm. Yeah. But, but that process of being on the trail just taught me how joyous it was to have this like simple life. You had things you had to do every day, you know, and you, and you had to survive, but if you were warm and dry and, and your belly was reasonably full and you had your food and you made it, we, we hiked about 30 miles a day. 
you were just like, man, life is so good. It was also a different time yeah. in my life, but there was also no internet. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's easier, yeah. to do, it's easier to do when you don't have that contrast. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's easier to do when you don't have the contrast. It would be crazy to think about doing now. I don't think I could step away from social media that long because of what I do. But. Right. And that's just so strange. You know what I mean? It's like we've built this just society like needs relevance. You know? Yeah. Like you need to be relevant or else you, like, you're, you're dead. Like you, you keep up. You need to keep changing. You need to keep doing new stuff or else like you're, no one cares. That isn't, yes. I feel that strongly as a, as a pseudo influencer now, I'll say, you know, I just interviewed Rob Wolf this morning and Rob is, he said he's stepping away from social media. And I thought, wow, that's brave. I, that'd be incredible because do you feel that too? I mean, I certainly feel that. Like I if it. I don't, yeah. I, I don't like, I don't like social media. I like sharing this information with people through podcasts and social media, but I don't like being tied to it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like feeling that I have to remain relevant, but I feel the same way. Like if I don't, if I don't post on Instagram, I'm like, ah, oh, I lost I, a little relevance today. I actually had a uh, thought this morning. When I was at the gym about social media because I saw somebody taking a photo of himself, uh, and I figured out what social media is essentially. It's just people highlighting what they have that other people don't, which everybody has something that somebody else doesn't have. I, like I can, like, I can find something in every single person that I meet that I'm jealous of them for that they have that I want. Mm -hmm. Social media is just like people's concept grow a lot. It's just highlighting things that you have that other people don't have. Um, and then the best ones are like doing that and showing people how to get that. But right. like, ultimately like, for, for you, like people follow you because you have information that they don't have that they want. Right. Like that's sort of like your thing. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It's like you have all this amazing information. You have an amazing brain. They want that brain. And so you put it on blast. Um, it, for, if you were building an account based upon, um, your physique and like you always posting shirtless selfies, um, instead of just sending them to me over text messages, <laughs> you're not supposed to tell people about that. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, um, what would happen there would people be okay. People who want to be better looking would follow you more. Right. Uh -huh. This is, it's, it's like, it's generally the things that people want that they don't have. Um, and then if you show people how to get that, then you grow even more. So and maybe like, that's, yeah, maybe that's the best use of social media, you know, is showing them how to get that or sharing the information. Yep. But yeah, it's a, I think it's hard for those of us in the space that consider ourselves influencers feeling that we have to have relevance, which is it's, maybe a, yeah. Yeah. I, I felt like I was, I basically been off and posted maybe one time in the last two or three weeks. And I feel like, I feel like this weird sense of guilt. Right. Like, oh, I have this platform, but I'm not using it. I know I could like, this is like usually with me running the business, like it keeps me away because I have so much stuff going on all the time, uh -huh. but generally like, it's just, it, and it's such a trap, man. It's like, it's, it's tough to, like, they, they design these apps to get you in there and spend time in there. Um, it is so that's a trap. Like, I've fall, I've un, cause like if people want to follow me or you or whoever for information, that's great. Cause like, that's what I want to put out there. Like teach people how to eat real food essentially. Is what, is what my thing is. And if that's the case, great. I don't follow anybody. Like I follow like Martha and my company. That's it. So like, I don't follow anybody on there. Um, the only social media that like I follow people on, because I can like, you, you can curate ideas, is Twitter. So like, I go on there, like I usually learn something when I go on there. I see something new, somebody posted. Uh, uh, but other than that, like I don't. Yeah, it's it's so easy to get sucked in. I um, I unfollowed every single person on my Instagram. I I put it to zero. You did, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm like three or four. It's like my company's <laughs> in Martha. I did the Instagram to I I completely cannibalized my Instagram and uh, it's great. one. One of my, one of the people I work with was like, you're a savage. And I was like, you know, it's nothing personal against the 150 people I just unfollowed. You know, yeah, I unfollowed you, right? It was just like, look, I don't want to feed because these Instagram, Instagram and Facebook, they figured it out. They're brilliant. Okay. They're super smart. It's dopamine and it's a hit. And I have realized doing my work, and this goes back to probably some of, um, I think it's Cal Newport with like deep work is the book that he wrote or yeah, atomic habits, digital, digital minimalism, digital, digital minimalism, deep yeah. work. Yeah. Like, um, when, if I have to go on Instagram for anything, I get sucked in and I don't even have a feed anymore. But if I go on to look at like what somebody's posting, I'll inevitably see the, the popular videos and be like, what's that? And then I'm 10 minutes down the road, I'm sucked into the rabbit hole. And so it's a really, really hard that's why I unfollowed everyone. It's like, I don't want to feed. I just Same want to thing. put information out there to share with people. I, I love and appreciate everyone that listens to this podcast, but I don't want to get, but in order to produce this information, you and I 
need to be able to focus and everything that's on our phones is trying to pull us away from that. And so, and I've noticed that whether it's the, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, there's a million apps on my phone. And I've actually gone through a little withdraw, you know, I'll be working and I'll think, uh, I'm get, I get like a little, I get like a little twinge. I'm like, it's almost like a cigarette that my body wants. Obviously I don't smoke tobacco, but my body wants the dopamine hit of Instagram. How to clarify just the tobacco or what? <laughs> I don't smoke anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone that knows me knows that I don't also don't even drink or anything. So I'm right. um, about as straight edge as it gets. Um, but I, I can feel it. I can feel the addiction as I'm trying to focus and do my work on the book or other projects. And I'm like, man, I need to get out of this. I need to fight this addiction. And I think that the, probably one of the more insidious parts of Instagram is that when you post, even if you're an influencer like you and I, you want to see how your post is doing. And so you go back to Instagram to look at your post, to interact with comments, and it pulls you into this distracting thing. And that is really tough because it pulls, I think it pulls both you and I and all people who are trying to do this away from our best quality work. Totally agree. Man. So let's just, maybe we should wrap it up for people with a little bit of insight from you and I can chime in with whatever I've got here, but how do you maintain your mental health amidst the storm, man? I mean, we're besieged by this environment that's unnatural. We're besieged by your work is, you know, I'm sure insane as the CEO of Perfect Keto. Uh, You know, my work is getting to be a little crazier as I'm trying to write the book and juggle a million things and produce good information like what, how do you maintain your mental health? Like, what do you do to kind of stay centered throughout the storm? Yeah. So how I think about it in, you know, I'm not always perfect to this by any means, but I try to stack variables that bring me back to a more normal environment or like bring me back in my body. Does this make sense? Like, I think it's so easy to have these things like Instagram or whatever, but like if I can, for example, I just had somebody over before that, you know, we were outside, we did some movement stuff. Then we like sat on the ground and recorded a podcast. And like, that was the podcast. Like, you know, getting outside, breathing fresh air, looking around, like having like, I'm inside now. My, like the, I have a window over there. Like the horizon is like three to 10 feet in front of me. Like not right. seeing the horizon, like looking around is like actually really bad for you. Uh-huh. Uh, so like this morning, I, or, or whenever, like if I work out, like working out outside with friends, like, like we did, you know, when you were here, same thing. It's like, as many of these things I can get to, to approximate my environment because like work for me is very artificial. Like being in a computer, having a team of people, like b- growing a really huge company, like that, that is a very artificial thing. And that adds to like, that brings a lot of artificial stress to my life. And so the more I can sort of get back to the basics, um, plan a hunt with some people, like th- these things, like the more I can change my physiological state and get back into my body and like, you know, cold plunge, sauna, steam room, things like that, working out, um, all of these things sort of recalibrate the stress levels. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult, man. Uh, Meditation is a huge one. Uh, so if possible, like whenever in the morning I wake up, like, again, if I can, if it's, the weather's tolerable, I can sit outside and meditate. We can meditate. Martha and I meditate together a lot. It's like getting that sort of connection in there. Um, I mean, as, as many things as possible, just to do my schedule, like stacking them. is sort of like my way to approach it. Like I, I have it. a friend, you have a friend come over tonight. We're going to fire up the sauna. We're going to have a meal. Like we're going to eat together. Uh, probably outside and then we're gonna go in the sauna and chat chat in there and like do that instead of just sitting on a couch you know? and watching tv or something right yeah something that approximates a more natural environmental experience or some way to like kind of get back to uh you know this uh, something that mirrors ancestral norms a little bit more perhaps right i like what you said about the horizon i think it is different when we can see long distances and when we're just outside you know i mean i mean think about when we were like always focusing on something that was really close to us. It was like, we're probably like doing something very specific and like had to focus a lot. Like the different types of you nervous, like think about being able, being able to like look around and like soak stuff in and not have to like focus on whatever is prob There's probably a lot there to your, like your parasympathetic versus sympathetic nervous system that we just haven't quantified yet. Yeah. Like I would guarantee it. Like it, you have to be in a safe environment to be able to like look around and like look to a horizon. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's probably a very parasympathetic thing. And I think in some ways it's quite soothing to be able to see a horizon totally. to, to move the, the eyes in that way. And we don't do that much. I'm like cooped up in my little inside space now too. Right. 
Yeah. I try to create you got a window though. I see. Yeah. I do have a little window. Yeah. And I definitely have like a little, a little ancestral movement bachelor pad here. I don't have any furniture. I just have movement space, meditation, where, cushion, sauna, punching bag. Where do you hang? What do you mean? Where do I hang? Like where's the yeah, rings, pull up bar, something like that. Oh, I've got like a pull up bar. Yeah. I just have like my own little ancestral space. I've got like my surfboards over there, my foil. I've got no furniture in this place, <laughs> no couches or anything. It's, great. it's amazing. Well, we didn't even talk about your book, but I'd encourage people to check out Keto Answers. Um, where can people yeah. find more of your stuff? Yeah. So the book's a little unusual. So I wrote it in a question and answer form just because I was, I was, an, like, that's how I was spending all my time on Instagram. I opened up my thing and there's, you know, dozens of questions. And so, I literally just try to answer every single thing of every question I've had over the last, you know, whatever, five, six years doing this uh -huh. stuff. Um, so re you, you can read it front to back, but you can just also like flip to the index and say, you know, can I do keto or whatever? It's like every question that I had gotten pretty much was in this book. Um, so you can find that on Amazon called Keto Answers. Um, and then just um, DR Anthony Gustin everywhere else. So Instagram, Twitter, and my website. So I have a weekly newsletter called The Feed that I try to keep up and keep relevant and help people out with. But yeah, those are, those are the areas. And you've got a podcast, Keto Answers, which uh, is amazing. Yes. yes. We'll change the name of it soon um, after What's the, the book came out. The book came out. I put all the answers out there. There's no more answers. No <laughs> more questions. Um, and it, it's time to expand a little bit. I just, I just want to talk about more stuff, man. It's like I want to talk about more than keto. Like keto is one sliver of one thing that like contributes to your health. I think that uh -huh. there was a lot of miscommunication. I think it's been communicated, um, especially now that the book's out. So don't know, that, don't know that new name yet, but we'll get you on whenever I whenever I redo it. We'll, we'll that sounds it. great. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it'll be, I think that's cool. I mean, and we talked about, you know, it's funny. We can pull back the curtain a little bit for people who don't know how podcasting works. You know, Anthony and I are pretty good friends from our time in Austin. And I was like, Hey, let's get you on the podcast. We don't really even have an agenda for this podcast. You know, everything you guys have heard in this podcast was completely organic. Anthony and I chatted for three or four minutes before and we just pushed record and wherever our both our collective brains went is what happened. And I think it's, uh, that's, what's kind of cool is that you're thinking about cool stuff. And as we saw, like we didn't really even talk a whole lot about keto or a little bit about carnivore, but we didn't talk a whole lot about medicine today. We talked about life and social media and stress and agriculture and cow poop and soil, you know, and hunting. So there's a lot of topics out there that are broader than, um, yeah, you know, I think that's what makes a good podcast. I've been thinking about this a little, little bit. It's like you can consume information through through books you can consume it through instagram posts or whatever but like doing a podcast like this like you just said it, like us asking each other questions of curiosity like we get a like you you can hear how people think right and you can learn how to think and i think that's a much different way like like we've communicated how we think about the environment and how we think about health and how we think of like and like why we think of like how that extrapolates to different things like that to me is what makes podcasts so important is is teaching people different ways to think and I, 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 I like showing people authenticity and, you know, one of the things that I appreciate so much about you is that you're one of the most generous and kind and authentic people I've ever met. And so I think it's cool to just be authentic with people you care about in a forum that people want to hear. And hopefully I think that we delivered a lot of value in this one. It actually was pretty awesome conversations. Thanks for coming yeah, on my brother. Exactly. Appreciate it, I hope man. we can hang out in soon in person soon. Do it. All right. All right. Thank you for listening to that one with Anthony Gustin. He is an amazing individual. I always feel deeply grateful when I get to hang out with him. And I really believe that here we are in 2020 leading lives that are very stressful, that are hectic, that are harried. Um, and we've lost our center a little bit. And certainly the coronavirus epidemic pandemic shows us that there's so much divisiveness, so much division between humans now, so much has become political and it really just kind of bums me out. I don't think it has to be this way. And I wish it were not to tell you the truth, but um, I'm very grateful to be alive at this moment, to be sharing the earth with all of you, to be breathing the air and trying to personally just get back to a simple life. And it sounds cheesy, but connect with the natural world in a more profound, more simple, more present way, because I really think that that is the teacher. And if we think about the way that our ancestors have lived in the past, they were eating animals nose to tail, they were spending time in the sun, they were exercising, and they were building communities, and that is what we are doing here in Austin, and I feel incredibly grateful to do that. And in our all of our lives, I think we search meaning, we search for meaning, we search for some answer to the question that life asks us, what is the meaning of life, and we have to answer that. We have to answer life and say, this is the meaning that I give to my life. And for me, 
that is really, you know, seeking truth and understanding how humans can live optimally. And it all kind of ties together. I really believe that we've gone wrong, that we've forgotten how our ancestors ate, we've forgotten how they lived, we've forgotten how they laughed, how they danced, how they sang, and how simple their lives were, and the things that they held most sacred and treasured, and the things that they held in priority. And I'm trying to reprioritize those in my own life. Obviously, food and biochemistry are fascinating to me. But as the subtitle of my book suggests, I really think there are many pieces of ancestral wisdom that have been lost in the way that we eat. That's why I'm so excited about animal-based diets. I've seen them hundreds, if not thousands of times at this point, bring people back to health when they were really, really headed down bad roads. And so it feels so meaningful to me to be able to be, answer the question that life asks me personally, what is the meaning of your life, Paul? And I, you know, I, I think about this every morning when I wake up, and usually my answer is the meaning of my life is to find truth, to share it with people as best as possible, and to ease the suffering of those who are in a position where um, they are hopeless, and to share with them tools and information that might bring them back to a greater place of enjoyment and quality and connection with the natural world. So I hope that uh, you all um, are able to do that. I hope you find this content valuable. I hope you will check out the stuff I'm doing. And if you find it valuable, I appreciate your support very greatly. The Carnivore Code book, www.thecarnivorecodebook.com to pre-order my book out August the 4th and Heart and Soil Supplements, heartandsoilsupplements.com. We are helping you reclaim your ancestral birthright to radical health. Love you all. Stay radical. I can't wait to talk to you soon. Next podcast coming on Tuesday. This is a big week, you guys. The Carnivore Code and Heart and Soil. Bye.